Good morning and welcome to Directing the Storyteller with Rita Coburn. My name is Heather Nice and I am the Director of Education at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum. We've invited Rita to speak to you as part of the No Malice Film Contest, a contest created in partnership with the Roger and Chaz Ebert Foundation and the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Foundation. The contest invites Illinois youth and young adults to create films around the topic of racial healing. To learn more about the contest and see the complete rules, visit bit.ly forward slash no malice film contest. Before I introduce Rita, I'd like to thank Chaz Ebert for the work she put into making these sessions possible. And I'd especially like to thank our funders, Healing Illinois, without whom this contest would be impossible. Healing Illinois is a racial healing initiative of the Illinois Department of Human Services in partnership with the Chicago Community Trust. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the expert leading today's session, Rita Coburn. Ms. Coburn is a Peabody and Emmy award-winning director, writer, and producer with nearly four decades in radio, television, and film. She primarily focuses on the stories of women by uniquely addressing topics from a multi-generational lens through the untold stories of prominent figures and key ideals relevant to our culture. Coburn co-directed and co-produced Maya Angelou and Still I Rise for American Masters, which premiered at the 2016 Sundance Film Festival and garnered a Peabody Award in 2017. Coburn's notable credits include historical documentaries on Black culture, The Oprah Winfrey Show, Oprah Radio, and BET Centric. Her current project in production is Marian Anderson, The Whole World in Her Hands. The documentary is a co-production of Coburn's company, RCW Media Productions, Inc., and American Masters. As Rita shares her content, be sure to enter your questions into the Q&A box so we can get to them after she finishes her presentation. If you have any issues hearing or seeing the presentation, please use the chat box to let me know. Rita, it's all yours. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here. And I have to tell you, I thank all of you for getting up and out in a, so to speak on this Saturday morning. And obviously Chaz asked me to do this and I've worked with her and I thought not only is this a wonderful opportunity, but we're at a moment in time and we're always at a moment in time and you're here for a reason. So whether you are a young person entering the contest, uh, you might be a home slice from my community because they're always coming out, um, or you might just be a person who's interested in film. I hope to share with you in the half an hour that I have to do a presentation, some of the ways in which you can tell your stories. This moment in time is a moment when people can have voice. And it is not only imperative that we have it, that we share it, but that you realize the uniqueness of your point of view. When you read a book, you have a theater of the mind. Nobody is in your head but you. And so you read those pages and you make pictures from your personal frame of reference to get you through that book. When you do a film, the images that you choose concretize a point of view and yours is unique. So for those of us who remember Michael Jackson and Thriller, whenever we hear the song, we see him in those pants and we see his hand shaking and him moving backwards and we see all the ghouls and what have you because we are past a point of just theater of the mind, he has concretized images for us. What you are going to do as you put together a film, you can use your iPhone, you can use photographs, whatever you use, you are concretizing images. And to have the opportunity to do short films, whether you win the contest or not, you're in a very good place because I think the shortest films in our culture right now are commercials. And when you see a commercial, you have a beginning, middle, end to that commercial. It tells you a story in 30 seconds. So I am quite confident you can tell a story in three minutes and whatever the time allotment is. 
but you're telling that story with or without words in certain places, but always with something visual. And you're gonna choose that in a way that shows who you are. Now, one of the first things I'm going to do, and I really appreciate you all starting with the poem for that Maya Angelou did. If it were not for her, I would not be here. And that was before doing her film. Uh, she taught me as a young woman, as a young black girl, who was a poor girl with a rich family and a rich history that when I didn't see myself in the school books, but I saw this wonderful community and these wonderful people in my home, I wanted to figure out a reason why everybody else couldn't see what I saw because I was missing. And so her telling her story, difficult as it was, uh, told me that I could tell my story. And so I'm saying that to you. Uh, what I'm going to do now is share my screen and I'm going to give you a couple of um, presentations and you're going to laugh because I'm not your most techie person and I kind of should be because I'm in this business. But the first thing that I'm going to do is show you my director's reel, which has pieces that I've directed, written, or produced, or worked on the production of, so that you know a little bit about myself. And then we're going to tear some of that apart and build it up again. So here goes. Now the time has come. If you got what it takes, we'll take what you got. I think that you got it. The longest running talent competition show returns. I've been waiting on you. With even more attitude. Am I seeing this? Wow. It don't get no blacker than this show. Apollo Live, Tuesday nights at 10, 9 central on BET. Be good or be gone. Brando played the Godfather. Vincent Giganti was called the Odd Father. He would walk the streets in a bathrobe. He would urinate in public. He would allow himself to be embarrassed, to be ridiculed. He'd been faking this Howard Hughes act all these years. Giganti was the boss of what's known as the Ivy League of Organized Crime. Giganti was probably the shrewdest, most clandestine, wise guy that ever walked the streets of New York. Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling. I bear in the tide, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the hope and the dream of the slave, and so I I rise, I rise. So um, I wanted you to see that director's reel so you would get an idea of some of the work that I do. And on my way to finding my voice, I did mob stuff. So you see Vincent Giganti, and uh, if you're familiar with The Godfather of uh, Harlem, that documentary that I did on Vincent Giganti, that was Vinnie the Chin. 
And I did that when I was much younger, didn't have quite as much sense to think that uh, I perhaps was in danger uh, dealing with FBI agents and people in the mob. And so I just did it. But that was not where I wanted to land. I always wanted to tell the stories that were forgotten. But on the way there, I did a job. And from every job that I've done, I've learned something. And that's what's going to happen to you in this session and even in just the idea in general that you are going to be doing uh, a contest or entering in. It's going to be about your voice and your perspective. I want to say some things that I wrote down because I wanted not to forget about you being a director storytelling and directing, and all of you are gonna be directors of your projects in the beginning, because there are times when you can be the executive producer and you can have other people direct for you, but this is a situation where if you're pulling together a project, the director is the buck stops here, the decision maker about everything else. In a really big uh, production where you have lots of money, you have a director of photography, but you, in this case, may be the director of photography. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. You're going to tell a visual story. And so your role as the director is how that project happens. You have to have a vision and you develop that vision from your own unique perspective. But it's not a big deal because you do it every day. Um, it is understanding that for every story, you need a beginning, middle, and end. And when you're looking for the beginning, middle, and end, what you're looking for is how can I say something? So when I used to teach young children in a writing program, I would sit by a kindergartner and say, tell me a story, give me one sentence for the beginning, one for the middle, one for the end. And a cute little girl said to me, my grandma was sick. I brought her some orange juice. She felt better. I could do a commercial on that. I could do a story on that, but she clearly had three lines that told me what was happening. When you do a film, that's gonna be called the log line. What is happening? What is your beginning? What is your middle? What is your end? And understand that your middle is going to be the biggest part. Your middle is gonna break down the story. In your middle, you may also have a beginning, middle, and end to an idea. So you might have three ideas in the middle that have beginning, middles, and ends, and then you end this whole thing, you bring it together. So one of the things that I want to say is, um, since you saw my reel, I'm going to take some pieces of the reel to, um, to kind of discuss with you. And uh, let's see, I'm sharing that and I'm gonna go up here and I'm going to get for you a little piece that I put together and I call it, uh, it's my no malice um, presentation. Okay, so this is what I wanna say to you. What you're going to do is create some moments through photography. How do you do that? If you remember in the reel, you saw the little girl take uh, some dirt and let it run through her fingers and read a book. You don't have to have sound. You just create a moment. When you look at this scene, you're looking at the back of someone's head, the curly, beautiful hair of a young black girl. But I said to my cameraman, my director of photography, I want you to fill the screen with her hair. Then I want you to pull back to, that was actually me because we didn't have any money, me combing her hair. Um, but this is what I mean. I want you to create a moment. You don't just have to shoot something that is there. Stand in the room, look at it from each corner. What do you see? What does the character that you're bringing to me see? If you are dealing with social justice, the idea of something in someone's hand or someone reaching out to someone else 
or something breaking. So I want you to just think about the moments that you create. You're going to, in this um, situation, we had a pull out and reveal. I always knew it was planned. I wanted to see that black girl's hair fill the screen because when I read Maya Angelou's story, she talked about the way that her mother had to comb her hair and it was so big. And I thought about growing up, how big my hair was and how hard it was to comb and what that meant. And so I just wanted a moment of that. That was planned, but I want you to know that you're going to be in some cases where you just got your cell phone out and there's something organic that you need to see. It just happens to be a flower there, or it happens to be a statue somewhere, or it happens to be the way snow is falling, and you're going to catch that, and that's going to help your story. But you are the director. You need a beginning, a middle, and end to your story, and you need to plan in that middle to have moments, because a film is nothing but a series of moments that come to you to tell you a story. We Yes. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Really quickly, can you drag your controls up because it's sitting right in the middle of the PowerPoint and that's what they're, it's covering some of your words. What control? Was that what it? you just did is perfect. Thank you oh, so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Sorry, guys. Okay, so now in this case, I have a little boy and a little girl in period clothing and look at the focus. They're sitting in a yard, but I only want you to see them. So what's in front of them, I want that out of focus. Play with your camera, play with your phone, play with your portrait part. And you never hear what they say, but you can sense that they're talking to one another, that they care about one another. I want you to create a moment. I want you to see that his hat is a little too big, that his shirt is a little too big because that's the way people bought clothes. They bought them for you to grow into. I want you to see that her dress has an apron around it and has something else for you to experience about her, that her big hair is now in two braids. I want you to talk about and think about creating moments. The reason that you, um, you do this is you're going to find a way to, um, to show me something. So now you may focus or not focus, speak or not speak. There needs to be moments in what you do where if I see a person's face and it's angry because they're marching somewhere and I see their sign, I don't really need to have them speak in that moment. And the, the whole idea is this is what you're gonna do is create these moments. They're going to be created by sounds. They're going to be created by pictures. They're going to be created by you, your point of view, your direction, it's your story. So as we stop there, I want again to say that there's a beginning, middle, and end. I want to give you some terms. When you are in television, there is a portion of your work that is development. Development means you took an idea and you're trying to develop it to see if you're going to actually produce that idea. So let's say you have three things you wanna do. You put them on a wall, you'll see in my picture when we're off of this uh, part of the screen behind me, I keep a chalkboard on my wall and I write on it. You may decide that what one of those ideas, you just don't have enough. It didn't make the cut in development. In development in the, in the world where I live, development is when I decide to raise money for a project. And if I don't raise enough money, it never gets out of development. Let's say you get out of development, you get into pre-production. When you get into pre-production, it's the planning, very important stage. It is the planning. It is the point where you are a producer as well as a director because you've got to know where to go, who you're going to talk to, what you're going to do. In the middle, once a camera rolls, you're in production. And so all of the camera rolling takes place in production. At the end, you're in post-production because you're editing. So I wanted to give you those terms so that you would have them. And then I want to go back a little bit to uh, letting you know that um, 
I have worked with some young people, which I really, really enjoy. So I finished my second year working with Lelaine Caffrey's group at uh, DePaul. And it is a joint Paul, DePaul project with the CHA. And we have young women from high school and they are working to do films. They are working so to do films that this is what lets me know what you can do because they've done three minutes films. And I'm going to uh, show you uh, some of the work that they did. So I'm going to go to the lookbook that we created. And when I go to this lookbook, um, that I created for No Malice. I wanted to tell you about the beginning. This is the Black Girl Joy Lookbook. You can just do a simple PowerPoint. You can do a storyboard, but you kind of want to, in the pre-production phase, lay your story out. This is the log line. As Black women continue to face racism, sexism, colorism, and many trials in this society, we are engaged in a movement that connects where we were to where we're going. Our legacy of strength despite vulnerabilities and negative perception is causing us to live and celebrate in the spirit of joy, Black girl joy. And we worked on this as a group of maybe five women and every word meant something to us. What are you going through? Racism, is that all? No, sexism. What do we call this? This is a trial. Uh, how do we get over it? We got strength. Where do we get the strength from? Our legacy. What do we do? We have to learn to laugh and we have to learn to celebrate. So they went and they got pictures just to help them to think about this. And they got Maya Angelou and Diane Carroll and Rosa Parks and then pictures of people that they got out of a magazine that just had a look that expressed their power and what they wanted to say. Then we said, let's give this some visualization. How do we want to tell this story? We want it to be beautiful. So one of the women who wrote our poem said, I like the light colors. I love the earth tones that you see in the left-hand corner, but I see flowers in my community, outside of my garage. I see happiness, I see joy. And so then we looked at, we created an aesthetic. We said, we come in different shades from albinos to dark chocolate to tan. This is who we are and we love our life. So we do this and we say, this is it. It is dancing in the sun and praising with hands. These hands of activists are holy. So they wrote this. Now, after they wrote this, they decided we've written uh, a poem and we're going to make that poem a part of our three minute piece. And when we do that, we're gonna be able to show you who we are and we're going to put interviews around it. We're gonna use our family. It was during COVID. So there was no way to just do as much as you could do otherwise. So I wanna give you an idea of what they did. So you saw their lookbook. And now I want you to see their actual piece. Black girl joy, happiness within, gold on the skin. Black girl joy comes in different shades and delicate faces. Maybe it's the features, maybe it's the heart. Beauty is in all, let's face it. Black girl joy. I think the message that I would send to black girls that I personally wish I would have heard more consistently growing up is just to be yourself and be yourself unapologetically. Um, you don't have to say sorry for who you are and you shouldn't have to feel the need to comfort people because they don't understand you. There's just a depth there and it can't really be recreated um, because it's something that is only found in black culture. Too clear to be unnoticed, too powerful and outspoken. Black girl joy. My mother.
grandmother and my grandmother, it was different back then. My grandmother left the South and came to the North so she can have her freedom, being a woman of color, being strong, being educated. I like Shirley Chisholm, Anita Baker. I like the body that I'm in. I'm happy with it. I was born black. Dancing in the sun and praising with hands. These hands are of activists and healers of generations. These outcries for justice are holy. Black girl joy is double dutch in Psalms. No weapon against us shall prosper. Freedom rings in our bones. We are covered in late needs for survival. Sisters, mothers, aunties, grandmothers, and daughters. Delicate faces, too powerful to go unnoticed. Black girl joy. I just like how ancestral we are. We're the first. We are so whole. We really know how to navigate our masculine and feminine energy. I feel like I really admire people who are not here anymore. All smiles and shines. Maybe it's the walk. Maybe it's the glow. Unexpected but unlimited determination. Black girl joy. Stand it together in formation. Inheritance creativity. Black girl joy. Leadership. Unison. And power. Blooming like a field of flowers. Delicate but rare. Honor us. Honor us. Honor us. Black girls are the aesthetic. Black girl joy. Joy. I gotta find a way Happiness to stop within. that. Uh, on the let's see. Black what girl did I joy do? comes in different shades and uh, delicate I, uh, I told you, uh, for a director, my strong suit is not being technically uh, great here. So um, I'm gonna stop sharing that. Though I love that I paused on that piece. I mean this is who we are and i'm so excited to work with young people and have them express what they feel is important and i hope it helps you to see that you can do this in three four minutes uh, with what you have um, with your own creativity i need uh angela or heather to let me know how much more time i have because i might want to show you something else you so, have at least 15 minutes, so you're good. Oh, I'm so happy with that. Okay, so now one of the things I'm going to tell you is it's really important that, uh, I'll be honest, when I first got the assignment to do Black Girl Joy, I kind of didn't want to do it. And I didn't want to do it because I like to do heavy things. I like to do things that are hard. I like to do things that make a real statement about us that um, helps us. And um, these young women convince me, uh, excuse me, um, you can play all that heavy stuff all day and night, but we need to have joy while we're living our lives. And our joy is heavy too, and we can make this work. And so they did. And we had those kind of honest conversations. I was honest with them about how I felt about what that was in development. And they had to convince me for me to come on board. Um, in this next one that I want to show you, I want to let you know that whatever your point of view is, it's extremely important. Uh, this is something that uh, Lily and Caffrey and the DePaul program, which I also found out about through Chaz, um, really drove home is that you can have your point of view. So this next piece that we're going to do is a piece where a young woman uh, has an unpopular in this society right now point of view. And her point of view is she does not like the idea of abortion. And she felt that she was told by a family member that she was going to be aborted. And she was upset about this. So as a result of this, 
I think that um, she had to convince other members in the class because some of the members didn't agree with her. They were like, you don't tell us, this is our right. And so I said, well, everybody has a right to think what they think. And so if you are operating in this, then let's have your point of view. And she was able to win the group over. Now, what you are going to see, let's go back to Black Girl Joy. You saw points where there was just a smelling of a flower that was organic. They were out there, hey, tell her to smell the flower. Hey, look at the way the sun is going. Let her stand over there, get that shot. Um, now let's go to the archives and let's find out what photos we can use. I am not sure what you will be able to use, but we were able to use photos and we got permissions to use some photos because it's an educational project. There was no uh, cost or anything involved. And we also got music that um, we got off the internet or maybe purchased. Um, there's stock music out there, there's free music out there, but you'll begin to get into that or you make your own music. And you saw the way we weaved in the poems with the interviews. In this particular documentary that we're gonna go into, it's, I call it, it's a short doc. It is going to give you more of a feel of there was research done. You're gonna see words on the pages of research. Uh, they scoured the internet, they found films that they could use to add, and they also did what we call a reenactment. And so they had actors, they became actors, and they acted out a section of what they felt was important to be in the film. So I am now going to work to show you that. Uh, let's see. We're going to get rid of Black Girl Joy. At least that's what I think I'm doing. Um, and I want to go to Better Choices is what this one is called. I always thought who are you to kill another human being? My father disagreed. I didn't want any more kids. I'd had enough. And you know it was our decision if I want you here. I have a lot of kids already and I've considered abortion many times. I could have aborted you. We almost did, but you're here. It made me feel hurt and angry. So I started to think, talk to my peers and take a look into the past. I believe people who have abortions because they're not emotionally ready to have a child, especially when it comes to teenage parents. Sometimes it could be rape causes. You may not want the trauma of the baby being within you because of what happened to you. One night stands or with sleeping with someone that you know you don't want to have a baby with. Pressure from your spouse, family, friends. No, I just don't think I could, you know, give up a child. And I didn't want to go through with it at first, you know, but then I realized that it's more realistic to do it this way. With money and everything, it'd be a lot harder for the other two kids. And me and the you are going to get those feelings. You got to know what the boy is doing and that you are safe. We need parents that are not going to talk down on their child. You can't be slow about stuff like this. Too many diseases. You need to know what your partner is doing. If you don't feel comfortable being with your partner, don't do anything. Don't work him in. Even though somebody may say they love you, he probably doesn't. You should talk to him about what you feel like and talk to him if you're ready to do this or not. And if he doesn't respect your decision, he doesn't deserve to be with you and you should just leave him. If a man doesn't want the responsibility of any more children, he should sit down and talk to the woman he's in a relationship with so they can have a mature understanding of each other. I've always had a sexual education class. The biggest tool that you need to use is your brain. If not, you have no business doing what you're doing. People in the 
world today are having less abortions because they're taking the contraceptions. They're taking responsibility of their actions. Women are becoming more aware of the harms they can do to their bodies and minds as they go through these procedures. Some women aren't really ashamed to become single mothers because they're ready to take on the responsibility of becoming a parent without anyone's judgment affecting them. I am thankful to be here. I don't keep looking back. I don't know why that was said to me, their delivery. My mom carried me for nine months and I was born. So a little bit heavier subject matter. Here I go again, I gotta make sure I don't, I think I'm still in that. Hold on one second. And um, okay, we'll get rid of that and get rid of that. Here we go. So um, what I want to really tell you is one of the things that you have to decide in development and in pre-production is what you want to do, what you want to say. And I encourage you to use your voice. We're talking about a subject matter now that is about racial healing at a time in this society when racial healing would provide a lot of answers to the questions that are in our society. Historically, it happens to be a time where we can further the discussion. Um, in some of these instances in the last uh, piece that we did, um, there was a time where you know abortions were illegal, so this person couldn't have this discussion in the same way. As African Americans have been here um, in this country for 400 years, uh, we finally have uh, places and positions have had a president, have a vice president now. What can you say or do from your perspective that would get people to think just a little differently? And I want you to think about the tools that you have as a director you have the interview, you can talk to people. They don't have to be specialists. It could be your grandmother or your father or whatever, you can do that. You also have the ability to use statistics if you want to do research and put words on the screen. You have the ability to just use your aesthetic and use a powerful moment from the pullback of hair to the sniffing of a flower, just to move your story along to the scenes of the sky. Those kinds of things will help you to put your story together. And then you have narration, you have words, you have people that could do the poem for you or put rap, I've done some of those, so you can put it together that way. So, you don't have anything that stops your creativity, but first you need to have the idea. You need to develop that idea. And once you see that that idea holds, you begin to think about the log line. What are you trying to say? It is very important to get to what you're trying to say in telling the story because that will help you edit the story down. If you have three ideas, but you can only really support two, do two real well inside of that uh, story that helps you with the beginning, the middle and the end uh, to get there. Remember your middle is the biggest part. Another thing that I said, I want you to watch commercials, but watch when you watch television and when you watch movies and films, Think about what they're telling you and think about it deeply. Think about what they're telling you, step back and then spend some more time with it. I'm a member of the Directors Guild. So I need to watch a lot of films right now to be able to uh, vote on directors for the Guild. This is separate from the Academy. That's another thing. I don't sit on that. So I sit on the DGA, the Directors Guild. 
Uh, last night, I watched Sylvie's Love. Uh, a night ago, uh, I believe I watched um, a really a, a film that I liked very much, which was um, the, I'm going to get the, the title wrong, but it's uh, The State Against uh, Billie Holiday. Uh, Lee Daniels, who did Precious, did that film. And it's kind of stayed with me. Uh, another view on Billie Holiday, being old enough to have also watched Lady Sings the Blues, that was done in a time period where there were certain things you could say. And now that we've progressed, this is a new uh, opportunity to say more things in a film. So you are in a moment in history, you have this opportunity. And as you take it, think of yourself as the director, think of yourself as the person who can develop this project and develop a log line, use some time to either storyboard or PowerPoint out what you want to do. Don't forget to also be in the moment and find organic opportunities to show and to tell and to support your story. And then you're going to work to edit it down and to make sure that it makes the statement that you want. And also recognize this, the statement that you wanna make, if it's not a popular one for this time, then you won by simply going through the steps. Um, everybody isn't going to like everything. Everybody can't win. Um, the different contests are out here. But the winning is in doing the work and being inspired and showing your creativity. I cannot tell you how many things I've gotten a no for but every yes becomes an opportunity for me to do more work. Mob stuff. I learned so much about research, about interviewing people, um, about backgrounds, about how to set something up. When I got to, uh, by the time I got to the Maya Angelou, um, it, Everything that I had learned had prepared me for that moment. And now as I get ready to do Marian Anderson, whom some of you may not know, um, she's a, she was a singer, a civil rights activist. She became through the gift of her voice. She was born in 1897. And when I say that, I pause because 1897 is just... 30 years or so past slavery. And here was this woman who by 1935 was considered to have one of the three best voices in the world and was probably the, forgive me, but the Beyonce or the whatever of that day because she made more money than almost any entertainer uh, just by singing. So she rose in that capacity. For, we're hoping that in this new administration, it will come back to the table that she will be on the back of the $5 bill. People will want to know more about her. And hopefully in that moment, the documentary will be presented. If I'm not mistaken, I think I'm out of time and it's time for me to take your questions. But I just want to give you um, a wonderful uh, encouragement to excavate your voice and do your project and feel really good about doing it and getting it out there. Thank you. So that was amazing, Rita, both the advice and the film. So thank you so much for sharing those. And we do have a few questions. Um, so Cheryl would like to know, she said there were pictures of celebrities and others used in Black Girl Joy and what looked like older footage in the second film. So how do participants make sure that the images and content they'd like to use are actually legal to use in their films? Well, the first thing that they have to do is go through what your stipulations are for the library, okay? That's the first thing. Now, everybody may not know this, but LOC, Library of Congress, 
they have a lot of photographs. So you go to loc.gov and you can research archival things. You can put in African-Americans, African-Americans in Alabama. You can put in pictures that they've taken. And a lot of those materials, even if they are of a Harriet Tubman or somebody like that, they are legal to use. If they are there and they are of, uh, you have to see if there's a copyright, but if they have a picture of Cicely Tyson or of Beyonce or somebody and you check, you may be able to use that picture because those pictures are part of what a public figure they can be used. However, there are pictures that you have to have license for. And uh, we did not have to have license for our pictures educationally. We were able to go online and find what was in what is called the public domain. I can use this picture. So that will give you a start, but everything can be Google. Uh, what pictures are legal to use of Beyonce? What pictures are legal to use of, um, of Cicely Tyson? Uh, there are photos out there that you can use. They might not be the ones you want, but there are some that you can use. Yeah, we're actually really big fans of Library of Congress and the materials we create at the library because Lincoln, they have the biggest Lincoln collection. So we use their stuff all the time. Um, for those of you that don't know, the National Archives also often has images that would be really helpful. They won't necessarily be a pop culture figures, um, but they do have resources as well that are pretty good. Um, so Max would like to know what inspires you to use filmmaking as a platform to share important stories to bring change to our society? You know, um, when I first started out, I started out by reading and the place where I went to get a library book in my small community, which was four blocks by nine, Phoenix, Illinois. I got lots of love for Phoenix. And there was in the basement of the village hall, the library was on one side, the jail was on the other. So you had to be kind of a girl with some spunk to go down there. There was probably only a town drunk in the jail, but to run past that and go to the library, right? So I saw a book, Toni Morrison, she had an Afro on the back cover. She looked like me, uh, the bluest eye. And I ate that and every book I could get, I read. So I started off by reading. I eventually wrote a book. But as I was growing, I was born in 58, things change the way you tell stories. And so I consider myself a storyteller and I was inspired by the fact that my story wasn't being told, that Pippi Longstocking had racism in that book, that Laura Ingalls Wilder had racism in that book. How could I write something? How could I show something that showed the perspective of me? So those things inspired me. And as I grew, all of it helped me to learn by reading, then by writing how to tell a story. And then film came along and I thought, whoa, this is another way to tell a story. And I began to embrace that. Perfect. So we have another question. It's a little bit different from these other two, but when you're making a film or working on a project and you get stuck and you feel like your creativity just isn't flowing, what advice do you have for our participants if they feel themselves in that position? Um, I have to tell you, I don't really think you're ever stuck. You just think that you're stuck. What people have to realize is when you go to the mall, when you go to the movie, when you walk around the block, when you have a conversation with someone, it all works into what you're doing. So there are times when what you need to do is you need to just give yourself the grace to take some time off from trying to think about how am I going to get that done? Now, I happen to love to play golf and I play by myself. I don't, I hope none of my golf partners are on here because I, I really like to play by myself because I'm out in the beauty of nature. And when I come out, I go, you know what? I need to start that off with the scene of a train. I need to go from the sky to a train. That's what it is. Give yourself some grace. You are not stuck. 
You just need to live too. You can't work all the time. You need to have some fun. You need to call up your girlfriend and just kiki and say stuff that you don't want nobody else to hear. And when you get off the phone, you'll go, hmm, you know. And and one time, I I got to tell you this. One time, I walked up to a 7-Eleven. There was a big burly man getting ready to go in, and he was talking to someone. And he gave me a wonderful line. It was horrible, but he said. I just got out of Stateville. I ain't nothing to play with. Well, I turned around and got back in my car. I did not go into that convenience store, but I thought about that sentence. I got just got out of Stateville. I ain't nothing to play with. And I was able to take that and do something. Listen to people, eavesdrop, be nosy, P hear how people talk. People don't talk the same way a book is written. And so you want to get language in your head and it will help you to continue. I love that idea of just taking the world around us for inspiration. And I think that's so important. Um, that's definitely great advice. So Chaz asked, if I'm going to include people in my film, do I need to have them sign some sort of a release form allowing me to use their image or publish it? And if so, is there a place that I could get a release form to use? Um, I think that's a great question. I like that idea of doing that. Uh, we used release forms at DePaul, and I think you can go online. Please use the research resources of so just Google it, release form for a documentary. You find something, and then you read it over, you copy it, uh, you you come up with what release works. And then for the, um, for the project, um, you know, Heather, you all may have either a release form or how it has to be done, but I think it's always important to uh, get your releases in order. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do have some information on there. Like we have all of the students do a release for us. And we say that anyone who's participating in filming it needs to have a release, but we don't specifically talk about the actors within the film if they're not officially participants in the project as far as being submitters. So they would need to definitely research that. Um, we have a question. You mentioned earlier using phones to shoot a film. Is there a feature of phones or a particular app that you believe might be something that would provide um, useful features for filming? Well, you know, uh, you guys have to realize that it's really embarrassing that I am not as technically adept as I would like to be. Um, but one of the things that I have done with my phone is um, just really just using the opportunity to shoot uh, video, uh, just the normal uh, way of just shooting with a phone. And then I like to take still shots and colorize them or move them around. There's so much you can do with a shot that you can add that. You want to think about mixing media. You want to think about all of it as texture. So that let's say, I love black and white, I just do. So a lot of what I do, I do in black and white, but let me be clear. I always shoot it in color because you can always go from color to black and white, but you can't go from black and white to color. So you wanna shoot it in color, you wanna change it to black and white, you wanna change the gradation of it. You might be able on your phone, you've got these panoramic features, you've also got the ability to slow things down. But I would say for the most part, shoot them regular and then play with them and take things in and out of color. If you saw the, the woman in Better Choices, she decided to take uh, the color out of some things. She also decided to do something that I thought was wonderful, which was as her father left the room, she went to the back of his shirt and just got to dissolve that way and then went to the floor. A lot of times I told people, shoot the people's feet coming up the stairs. You need to have different things, which is really called your cutaways 
and your B-roll. You want to, somebody's using their hands and you saw in the pictures when we did Black Girl Joy, these hands of activists are holy. So they're holding on to a podium. And so then you tilt down and you get a close up of their hands to go with what you're saying. You want to make movement happen as you create. So you talked a little about this in your answer that you just gave, but do you have any other tips for how they can direct lighting in their shots or how they might use lighting? Well, I'm going to tell you again to go to the internet and you want to look at three point lighting. Um, you want to look at having a backlight, a fill light. Okay. So you want to light from behind. So if right now I'm having natural light, I'm in this room, I have light coming from the window to me on the side and I put another light here, uh, on, on my desk and it is enough for us to get a good picture. But if I take some of the light off, that area back there is darker now and that is a different look. And so if I put my face over here and I'm in that, then look at the light coming here. And then you see that I've got a dark part of profile here. So you want to play with light like that. You want to play with if somebody is saying something and it's scary, put them out of the light or put them in the light for a reason because it's about positivity. When you saw that light beam come down, but look up three point lighting and think about that. Think about a backlight a fill light from the side and a main light and play with the lighting? That's a very good question. I'm a big person for lighting. So again, when you saw in, uh, in Better Choices, it was COVID, we had everybody use a plain back wall and just them because we wanted you not looking at the stuff in their office. We wanted you to see their face, their profiles. But then sometimes you wanna set a scene, you wanna put a statue over there and you wanna put that in or out of the light. So um, look up three point lighting and uh, play with light. Yeah, that's a good idea. Rita, let me ask you this. Would you have time to answer a few more questions? Cause we are getting close to 11, but we actually have several really good questions and I'm Absolutely. not really sure which one. Absolutely, to go with Perfect. it, it's good. So Max says that you talked about how life is a story. How can we take our experiences and adopt them to film? Okay, so that's what this is about. So what you've got to decide is point of view. Okay, so my father only went to fourth grade, but he was a really good dad for me. If I told the story from his point of view, I would tell it in the sentences that he spoke, the language that he had. I would not use words that he wouldn't have used. You have to sit inside of the story. You have to sit inside of each character in the story. So what you're talking about is point of view. So your point of view is important. I don't care who you are. So, so we had this one uh, young woman, I loved her, Siklaley uh, in our uh, class uh, at DePaul. And she wanted to tell the story of when Mexican people come to this country and their children go to school and learn English, but the parents don't know it, a lot of times the children have to interpret for the parents, but they can't interpret the feeling, the emotion. So they're sitting there in the doctor's office and they need to tell the story for the parent. And so she wanted to say from a young woman's perspective, that was a hard thing. Look at that point of view. That's not a point of view we have in the society. We see uh, English as a second language, who should, but what about the point of view of a little girl that can't convey how sick her mother is to a person that speaks the language because she doesn't have the words. So I want you to think that whatever your point of view is, use that as an example. Use an example that you have a point of view 
and you have to use it to get to your story. So what you're talking about is point of view. Perfect. So kind of a different question. Leah is interested in knowing if you have any advice that you could give our participants if they're interested in trying to secure funding for their projects. Well, if you're in the state of Illinois, you need to look up funding for films again on the internet. Uh, what you're probably going to find is there are a lot of grants out there. It depends on who you are and what you're looking for. There are grants for young people. There are grants for women. There are grants for people that want to do action films or people that are using things digitally. So that's one way to do it. And I have to tell you, it is really, you got to hang in there on this. Um, I went to a conference called Produced By about 2018. I kikied around, met some people and all the rest of that. And then last year, somebody from that called me about an opportunity. That was two years of baking and I didn't even remember as much. Grant getting and writing is one way to do it. People do GoFundMe. They do all of these kinds of things to get money for films. But please don't let that stop you. Take your cell phone out and start to get to work. Get on your computer and make the PowerPoint. Put the ideas out there, but make it cheap until you can get the money because you're learning as you make it. And that's what you have to do. Don't have a lack of funding stop you from being a filmmaker. That's great advice. So when you're doing a short film, how do you balance using live footage versus photographs? Well, we have a lot of different media and some of films in recent years have used photographs to such a wonderful degree. And I'm thinking about um, the film that was done on James Baldwin. Um, oh boy, I don't know why I don't have it on the tip of my tongue. Um, the James Baldwin film used photographs beautifully. Um, Boy, do you know the film I'm, I'm, I'm Googling it because I watched it. I am not oh, your I'm not your Negro. Thank you very much. Leah, thank you. <laughs> um, hi there, uh, Gerald. Thank you for being here. Um, that film used photographs. So one of the things I want you to do is um, watch films. Watch films that use photographs, but also in, in terms of watching commercials which don't use photographs that much, every moving piece of film is actually a photograph. Um, it's just a moving one. You can stop the frame, you can see a reaction. And when we do an over shoulder shot, think about a man who hugs a woman there's the look of the side view of that, but then there's the over shoulder shot of his face or her face. If her face is smiling or loving, or if her face is frowning, it makes a statement. And that is almost like a picture of that. So you could freeze that and go somewhere else and you've made a statement. Um, I love to use photographs in documentaries and a lot of times I have to because there wasn't footage at that time. So you can balance it. One of the things I'm doing with this new film that I'm working on is I'm doing reenactments and I'm using photographs going into the photograph, moving around that photograph, not just showing it. Say there are four people in the photograph. I go to the photograph, then I go into one of them. 
then I dissolve to a reenactment about that person that isn't that person, but it is the prototype, an older woman or a young man. So play with that. But I think photographs, particularly in shorts, add a richness. So we watched Maya Angelou on Thursday and thank you so much for helping us arrange that because it was amazing. Seriously, it was the highest attended webinar I've ever hosted. So thank you for that. Um, you know, both the woman and the film were just phenomenal and you encapsulated her life so well in two hours. And so I think for participants, you know, obviously they're working with much shorter time period. So if they're trying to do a documentary how do you identify the most important parts of a life to tell that story? Well, I, this is not a negative statement. You start from a point of failure. There is no way in two hours to tell the story of someone who is 86 years old. You just can't get it all in. Once you take a deep breath and you realize that that is true, then what you want to do is, what do I want to say about this person? And when we were doing that documentary, one of the things that I think was very important was what was her perspective about it? So some people said, well, what happened to her brother? It wasn't his story. It was only his story as he related to her. That helped you to edit out that part. Um, there are times when you have, if you're telling something that everybody already knows, then one, you need to tell it because people know that she did the inauguration point, but what can I tell you that you didn't know about it? Bill Clinton said his grandpa was like her grandma and had a store like that. And that's why he chose her. Well, so now I've told you something that you didn't know about it. So you wanna tell me things, if you're telling me something I already know, state that clearly, but unpeel that onion and give me another layer to it. The other thing that I think you have to do if you have a short work is don't try to tell too much. Center on a point of view and tell that point of view. And then as you tell that point of view, you can get a little deeper in it. Another way to do that is just to fastly tell a bunch of things. Um, not what I do, but I saw it done very effectively in a film. Stanley Nelson did the film on Miles Davis. And as a transitional tool, he would use this area where he would go fast flashes of what was happening. Kennedy died, this happened, da, 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 da. It was so fast. And I listened to him at the Black Harvest Film Festival and he said he would come to the editor faster, faster, faster. So that in lightning speed in 10 seconds, you may have seen 45 shots that if you didn't keep up too bad for you, but that's how he moved you. Note that that's a transitional tool. If anybody has seen the film on Amy Winehouse, that film is a good film for you to watch because Amy Winehouse had seven years of life in the camera from 16 to 23. And it was all done on cell phones, people. So look at that. They, everything, they pulled her cell phone footage and her cell phone footage told the story, but what were the transitional tools? She would say, go to London. So they'd have a shot that would get you there. They'd have an aerial or a drone shot. Think about that. Think about transitions to go through time when you're doing a film. And that way you can tell a story a little faster. It may be the ch -ch 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 that Stanley did, or it may be, I now see the lakefront and I'm gonna get you over to this space. So you want to think about transitioning me in time if I have a lot to tell and a little bit of time. Such amazing advice. I just, like I'm sitting here listening, I'm like, they have no idea, like just the amazing advice you're giving. So we have two more questions. Um, one of our participants would like to know why are the deeper stories so important to you? Well, first off, um, they just like haven't been told. And 
I don't think people are really respecting my people. And um, I know they're not. And they don't care. And when I say they, I'm looking at a larger society that will see me in a film and they love to talk about my violence, my sex, my poverty. But do they really care that my father made a living? He went out to a steel mill every day. He breathed steel to the point that every once in a while he would sit in the house and he would blow his nose and a ball of steel would come out because they didn't have OSHA that was, was, was saying, no, they put black men with little education in steel mills and worked them like horses. And by the time they got to retirement, the steel was covering their lungs and they were dying. So until you tell enough of that, I have work to do. Now I have stuff that I think is funny and I have stuff that is about love and I tell that too, but I really want you to understand my people better because I'm black for a reason. And um, it's important to me. And if I don't tell it, I'm not trusting you to tell it because you haven't done it yet. So it's part of my job. Wow. Um, so the last question, and I saved this one for last because I thought it's kind of a good note to end on. So Max would like to know, what was the greatest advice you ever received as a filmmaker? Hmm. as a filmmaker or maybe even as a director like just what's the best advice you've ever received in the industry so i'm going to tell you something that happened between maya angelo and myself and um we had developed a relationship because i was doing oprah radio so i was going to her home to record radio programs with her for four years. And um, that meant that once a month, I spent time at her home, either in New York or in North Carolina. And so by the time I got ready that I wanted to do a documentary and I asked her, um, would she do a documentary? She said three things to me. She said, you know, I don't need nothing else. Now I happen to know black women well enough to know that's when you need to just shut up and let them talk. And so I waited and she said, do you know what you're asking? I waited again. And then she said, if you're gonna take it, take it all the way. I am still unpacking that. Did I know what I was asking? I was asking a woman who was at the end of her life, who had done seven autobiographical memoirs and 30 some books to dig up all that stuff all over again. Little girl, do you know what you're asking me to do? I'm almost dying and you want me to go back there and dig that up for you. So when you're asking and when you're respecting another person's life, she's Maya Angelou to everybody else, but this was her life. Ending, and I'm asking, do you know what you're asking? Do you know what you're asking? Because you're about to do a really big job on a really big person. Are you ready, girl? And do you know what this could cost you? Do you know that other people won't like you? Do you know that other people will hail this? Do you know that it might put you in a position that will ruin some of your other positions? I'm still unpacking what she said. So I can't tell you how good the advice was because I'm not out of it yet. And then the last thing she said, if you're going to take it, take it all the way. And that I think is what you need to do. You need to take your stuff all the way. If you're going to do something, settle on what it is you're going to do and go there go there. And if you're not ready to go there, sit back and don't do it. If you don't want to do this, don't do it. If you want to do it, do it all the way.
that I, I couldn't think of a better example to share. Uh, she's just, she's such an amazing woman and just being able to hear that story through you after, particularly after watching the film, like that's, I couldn't think of a better way to end this. So Rita, thank you so very much for this wonderful presentation and for sharing your expertise and your advice. Um, I'd also like to thank our participants for spending their Saturday morning with us and to learn more about the topic and just, just again, learn from an expert. Um, before you go, I'd like to remind you that we'll be doing expert sessions every Saturday at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time through March 6th. Next week, we'll hear from Academy Award nominee Steve James as he shares his presentation, The People in My Films, Portrayal and Relationships. To register for the remaining expert sessions, go to the contest website at bit.ly no malice film contest. I've also put a link in the chat box. If you missed last week's session with Troy Pyre or you hopped into today to today's a bit late, we are posting the recordings to the site a day or two after the fact because we have to caption them. Um, so you can catch up or rewatch them if you get stuck during your present or during your uh, filming and making your projects. One last thing. Please, before you leave, shoot me a quick chat telling me where you're watching from and how many people are watching with you. And Rita, if you haven't had a second to run through the chat, you totally should. You got some amazing comments from our participants. So thank you all so very much. I'm really always honored. Um, Chaz has never steered me wrong. Because of her, I'm involved with DePaul. Um, I found a executive producer at uh, the Ebert Festival. Um, and so one of the things that happens is this all boils down to people. And you meet people and you try to honor that interaction. And thank you for what you said about Maya Angelou, because I honor the fact that I could even spend all the time that I spent with her. And so uh, for all of you that spent this time today to listen, um, and to have some things to take away. Thank you for spending your time with me. Uh, I honor your stories and I look forward to looking at what you come up with now and later. And um, thank you, Heather and Angela. It's been just really wonderful. And I think what your presidential library and what you're doing for Illinois is really, really top rate. And I also wanna thank the students at DePaul because they uh, helped me to progress um, as a person by working with them and uh, sharing their life with me and uh, having me have an opportunity to help them make films. Again, Rita, just I, this has been incredible. Um, you know, I, I loved Troy's last week and I was thinking, I don't know how we're gonna top that. And yours has just been, you proved me wrong, you have, you have done an amazing job and it has been um, such a joy to listen to. And I, I just trying to figure out how we can make sure everybody hears this because it's just been amazing. Um, so again, thank you so much everyone for spending your Saturday morning with us. And we do hope to see you again next weekend. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, screen share just the, the blank screen to give you a chance to finish up any comments that you wanna make. but. Thank you all so much. And hopefully we'll see you again next week. Okay. Thank you. Bye Rita. Bye.